So today, Torch Pro welcomes on NHL legend, Stanley Cup champion, won a few gold medals with Team Canada. He's crushing it in life after hockey, beyond the ice. Chris Pronger. Chris, thanks for joining today, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I'm excited to get into your full journey as a hockey player, what you're doing beyond the ice. And I want to throw it back to really where it started for you and where it all began. So where did you grow up playing the game of hockey? And I guess, how'd you fall in love with it? I uh, grew up in Dryden, Ontario, which is basically the center of Canada, mm -hmm. two hours north of Minnesota. So uh, as you might imagine, pretty cold. <laughs> um, and hockey was something that we just did every day, whether it was road hockey, uh, playing in the basement, playing out on the outdoor rink uh, at the local community rink, uh, shooting pucks at our garage. Uh, it was something that my brother and I did uh, virtually every day. And, and with our buddies and, and uh, you know, playing hockey and then, uh, you know, in summertime golfing, uh, springtime playing baseball, uh, you know, really trying to just play whatever seasonal sport it was we were playing it and uh, uh, tried to, you know, just be a kid. You know, right. I think a lot of, you know, people see the end result and, and they forget that at the end of the day, you're just a kid playing a sport and, and enjoying yourself, having fun, playing with your buddies, socializing and, and doing all the things that, uh, you know, we hope our kids do one day. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned your brother. Is he older or younger? Two years older. Older. So did he, did he beat up on you a little bit, lead to your development as a hockey uh, player? Early on, yeah. There was, uh, <laughs> there was a few fisticuffs and a few yeah. uh, battles that uh, hardened me up for, for life, uh, life after uh, being a kid. And uh, so it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And, and having a, an older brother and, and him having – older friends around. I had to step up my game and play a little bit bigger than maybe I was at the time as a kid. So uh, that certainly helped me, I think, and served me well as, as uh, my hockey career uh, continued on. Yeah. And you're, were, you're were obviously a superstar growing up right throughout your childhood. And so getting right into your NHL career, you were the number two overall pick in the NHL draft um, and you were 18 years old. So what type of pressure did you feel when you were first drafted and, and how did you handle it? Yeah, you know, I don't think I felt any more pressure than I put on myself. Uh, I had high expectations for myself and, and always probably applied more pressure uh, than, than the coaching staff and teammates and, and people around me. Uh, was very hard on myself and making mistakes and, and playing the game. I wanted to, you know, you want to play a perfect game every time. And it's sports is a game of mistakes in general. And so um, you know, push myself pretty hard. And, and at times, you know, you, the ups and downs of an early career, uh, you know, it, you can beat yourself up pretty good and, and it can, it can take its toll. It, it's a long grind of a season, the NHL that is. And, um, you know, when, when you're hard on yourself, you, there's going to be moments where you're tired, you're beaten up, you're, you're banged up, you're not feeling great. Uh, maybe you don't have your best stuff and, you know, it can be a bit of a grind. So, you know, for me, you know, getting through those first couple of years and kind of getting over the hump and, and kind of finding myself, finding my comfort zone, finding how I needed to train, prepare and, and be ready to uh, play to the best of my abilities each and every night was a bit of a process and a journey. But, but once, once you get there, you kind of have the template and the understanding of what it's going to take and then you continue to refine and, and, and add new elements and, and, and allow yourself to kind of get better in a number of different facets. Yeah, you probably learned from a lot of your mistakes early on. And as an 18-year-old in a professional sports league, I don't know how I would handle that pressure. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think back, I'm like, well, all my buddies are at college getting drunk and, you know, having a good time and making mistakes under the guise of they're going to school. So uh, mine was a little more out front and in, in front of the media and in front of uh, – you know, the fan base. So uh, not the easiest of circumstances to come into, but, uh, uh, you know, being the second overall pick, high expectations on me to perform and, and kind of, you know, at that time, push Hartford and, and the Whalers to another level. And uh, unfortunately, after my second year, they felt they needed to go in another direction. <laughs> <laughs> and they moved me to St. Louis. <laughs> right. And so now in St. Louis, you you early on in your career were fortunate enough to play with some of the NHL's greatest players of all time, right? Brett Hall, Wayne Gretzky, Grant Fuhr, a few other Hall of Famers. And so what were some of the greatest lessons that you learned from those guys that you applied to your own career? 
Yeah, I think, you know, you're able to kind of, as you pay attention, you know, you got to play the game and you got to, you know, worry about that other stuff afterwards, but seeing how Wayne Gretzky handled the, the fandom and, and the, the media and the scrutiny and the notoriety and all that stuff. And seeing how, you know, Al McGinnis prepared for practice and games and trained and things like that. And you're able to really kind of pick the best pieces from all these different players and continue to add them to your repertoire and add them to how you, in your own way, you know, you have to be true to who you are and how you manage life, but also, you know, provide little uh, nuggets of information to kind of, you know, put into how you deal with the media, how you, you know, prepare for a game and how do you get yourself amped up each and every night and how do you get amped up to go to practice and, and push yourself to get better each and every day. And so, uh, you know, as I said earlier, it's a process. And as you kind of refine that each and every day, each and every week, month, year, you know, it gets a little bit easier and until you're, you know, it's kind of plug and play and you're just kind of retooling and adding different pieces all the time. You know, you're watching players and other teams and how they do certain things, how they're playing the game, you know, how they're reading certain plays and you're saying, okay, what did they see? And you're kind of pulling all those things and seeing, all right, is this something that I can do? <laughs> Number one, right. Is this something that I'm going to be able to analyze as the game's going on? I go, okay, this is what's coming next. This is how this is going to happen. So uh, you're, you're always kind of learning and evolving. And, you know, I knew, you know, from the, those early days, I knew I was going to be done the day I stopped learning and right. getting better. And so uh, for me, it was just, you know, trying to get better each and every day and improving on, you know, whatever it is, whether it's your physical fitness or your mental toughness, your wrist shot, your passing, your skating, whatever it was, you know, continually improving each and every day. Yeah, there's so many different parts that come into being a successful athlete, whether it's on the ice beyond, you mentioned the mental part of the game. And so going along that process in your career in, in 2000, you won the Norris Trophy for best defenseman, the Hart Trophy, MVP in the NHL, and first defenseman to do that since Bobby Orr, I think, in, in the early 70s. And so there was almost a 30-year gap there. But for you as an individual player, what made that season so special for you? You know what? I had gone through like three – three seasons or three off seasons of training and it was just you know it's just building blocks and, and adding layers on top of what I'd already done the previous summer and then throughout the course of the season and it was just a matter of continually building up my body uh, for the long grind of the season and and we had we had lost out the year before in the first round so it allowed me to have a full summer of training and so for me it was just a matter of putting the work in preparation and then the season got off to a great start. I felt good. My body was healthy. Uh, you know, I think an, another reason why I got a lot of notoriety that year is we won the president's trophy all the while Al McGinnis got hurt in the middle of the season and he missed probably a month and we didn't skip a beat. And I, you know, I think that kind of put more eyes on me as well. And um, you know, I, Yar, Yager was, in his prime that, you know, at that time, and he was hurt. So there, you know, the reason I won, <laughs> the reason I won is the Pittsburgh writer voted for me for first. Yeah. You're giving yourself so much second, credit. And that gave me, I think one extra vote over him. So uh, there was, you know, back then you could see who voted for who and how it all played out. And yeah. so it was a, it was a very tight uh, voting and uh, I, th I think I won by like one or two votes. Yeah, which, I think it was, it was one vote, which was the Pittsburgh vote. That's crazy. Uh, so uh, <laughs> thank that, God I didn't have any interaction with him. Yeah, you treated <laughs> him well after the, the post game. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You might not have voted for me. <laughs> I love that. And so is, do you think that's the point in your career? Like, obviously, you were crushing it on the ice. But do you think in that point in your career is when you really stepped up, like, your leadership aspect of the game? Uh. No, I, I've, I've always been a leader in, in the respect of, you know, I'm going to go out and play to a certain caliber, a certain level, uh, and, and I'm going to leave it all on the ice every night, uh, you know, step up and say something when needed. Uh, uh, that's just kind of who, who I am and how I'm wired. And whether you have a letter on your jersey or not, uh, I'm going to tell you what's going on. Um, so it, it was it was, it, it was an added uh, benefit and an added uh, 
bit of experience and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't know what it would be called, uh, stature, if you will, that people are going to take you a little, maybe take you a little bit more serious. I had now been in the league seven years. So I had that side of it, that experience, that knowing the league, knowing the players, knowing, you know, everything around it, it, it takes a little bit of time to, to fully immerse yourself in the league, garner all that experience, know your way around the league, know the comings and goings of, of the different teams and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it, at that stage, I'd kind of fit the, the comfort experience, understanding what's required of me each and every night, uh, practice games, et cetera. And, and, you know, everything was just kind of fell into place. And it was just one of those seasons where I played with our checking line that whole year and we got, we, we played great. We were always scoring on the other team's top line. So it was, it was like a, a double whammy. Um, so it just, you know, everything kind of fell into place. Yeah, that's awesome. And from the past interviews I've heard with you and people that know you, you, you seem like a natural born leader and aren't afraid to speak up and, and tell the guys what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you like it or not. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You got to be as a leader. You got to have yeah. that trait. Yeah. You you're not going to, hey, you're not going to make everybody happy. No. Nope. Damn right. And so in 2007 with the Ducks, you, you finally host the cup, right? And so what was so special about that team that won the cup versus all the other great NHL teams that you played on? What, what team, what did that team have? Well, it had everything, you know, we could play a tough game, beat you up. We could play a finesse game and win seven, six. We could play a tight defensive game, win two, one. Uh, you know, we had all facets on that team and, that, and that's a, you know, we had a great group in the room. Everybody, to, with the exception of Scott Niedemeyer, nobody had won a cup. So everybody was driven and purpose-driven that this season we were winning the cup. And it was cup or bust. And everybody bought in, you know, from ownership to management, to coaches, to players, to families, to, you know, all the way down, trainers, et cetera. And everybody was in it to win it. And when you have that kind of buy-in, it, it, you can do something special. And we were able to do that. Yep. It's, it's interesting you mentioned the fact that not many people besides Niedermeyer had won the cup. And so that's something that's easily to rally around as a group. But then I guess pointing it to this current day NHL, you look at the Tampa Bay Lightning, who have won two in a row now, just swept the Panther, Panthers chasing their third. It's crazy that they're still motivated after back-to-back -back titles to go win a third. And I could see from a player's perspective why it's easier to go after and get that first one. Yeah, but I think when you're when you as it relates to the Lightning, you know they've got players that are in their prime. They're they're prime, you know, from Stamkos to Kucherov to Vasilevsky to you know Hedman. You know their core, Braden Point. Their top players are in their prime. You know peak peak earning peak peak uh, games. You know so. Um, and they're, they've been, they've done an excellent job of adding pieces around, signing players, letting players go, uh, moving pieces around the board to, to kind of fit in around the cap uh, and, and been fortunate, fortunate with some injuries to be able to, you know, use the cap to, you know, and, and, and the various <laughs> uh, loopholes in the cap to fit in. Uh, but, but they're in there and they've yeah. done a masterful job of, of managing the cap and managing their roster uh, in keeping that core group together for this long, it, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, I'm rooting for them for a third straight. It would be interesting. And so now you won a gold medal in 2002, 2010, right, with Team Canada. And so how is that feeling different, winning an Olympic gold medal from a Stanley Cup? Yeah, it's, you know, obviously winning a championship is awesome. And it's an unbelievable feeling, winning for your country, the whole thing is just a little bit different. You spend nine or 10 months, blood, sweat, and tears with a group of guys every day, all day. And then you're thrown into this Olympics with a bunch of NHL players who you're trying to kill <laughs> a week earlier. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're thrown in for two weeks and you're playing, you know, you're playing for your country. And, you know, obviously you set any differences you might have, you set them aside and, you know, your, your, your teammates and, and you're playing for your country and, you know, you're trying to, you know, win a championship and have success and win an Olympic gold medal. And um, it, it's a tremendous feeling. Vancouver in 2010 was, was unreal in, in 
you know, it was the last event. It was, if we were, we were to win gold, we were going to win the most golds of, of any Canadian Olympic team uh, in history. And so it was a fitting end to the, to the uh, winter games in, in Vancouver and, you know, being able to, to close it out like, like we did in overtime and, and obviously Sid scoring the goal and, you know, all the notoriety that ensued from that was, was pretty cool. Yeah, that's special. And so kind of to wrap up your, your hockey career here, and we've talked about all the accolades, you, you won a cup, you won these gold medals, MVP, Hart Trophy, Hall of Famer, but what moment for you in your hockey career are you, are you most proud of? Um, you know, I think longevity and I think, you know, leaving it all on the ice each and every night and, and having your teammates, your coaches, management, ownership, the fan base know that each and every night you're coming to bring it, bring your all and, and play to win and, and, uh, provide whatever leadership the team needs at any given moment in time. And, um, you know, be able to hold your teammates accountable and hold the other team accountable for anything that may transpire throughout the course of the game series, whatever, and, uh, and play to the best of my ability each and every night, whether it's, whether I'm at hundred percent, whether I'm at 50%, if I'm playing that you're, you're going, you're going all out and going 110%. Yeah. And that, that's a hell of an answer. Not, not one event, but more of your holistic career and, and what you've done throughout the 20 years. And so that's great. And so now life beyond hockey, right? You retire and you figure out your next step, but you recently launched a company with your wife, Well-Inspired Travels. And so tell me more about your inspiration for the company here. Yeah, it's, well, it's my wife's baby. She's, uh, you know, it's, it's been in the back of her head since she was a young, uh, young kid when her dad was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer and they used to travel and see the world and, and he used travel as a way to, uh, a bring the family together, but B, uh, you know, go on wellness trips and try to, you know, fight for his life. And, and from that, they then went on a lot of family trips and, and saw the world and, and that really left the mark on her. And, uh, as my career was winding down and, and social media began to explode and uh, the world kind of opened up a little bit more because of that, uh, it allowed people to have a lot more uh, greater access and, and visibility to, to what's going on around the world. Um, you know, she, it started off a little bit smaller and, and has kind of grown into what it is now and, and really just being a boutique luxury travel company that, that provides, um, you know, consultation and, and uh, briefing on an understanding of who you are, what you're all about, what you're looking for, how best we can serve you and help you and, you know, setting up trips of a lifetime and, and understanding the dynamics of your family, your business, whatever it is, and then going out and executing on that and, and understanding and having been in your shoes and, uh, you know, whether, you know, our, niche clientele would be athletes, entertainers, CEOs, business owners, high net worth family offices. And, and again, the reason for that is that's who we know. That's what we know. Right. Um, we've got a unique ability to, to understand the needs of that specific clientele and having lived their life and been in their shoes. Uh, you know, we're, we're able to kind of get out in front of a lot of situations that may transpire that, uh, that others might not know about. Right. And so you mentioned being in your client's shoes as a former NHL player. And so did you use travel a lot as during your playing career to help unplug and, and kind of get away from a lot of things? Yeah, I did, uh, you know, postseason. Uh, and then, and then when I was done, uh, frankly, and when I was injured, uh, I used travel a lot to heal and, and really get, uh, my body, right. My head, right. Uh, I did a lot of, uh, rehab kind of on the, we'll call it on the road. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, it allowed me to kind of get away, get out, you know, get out of the public eye, get out of the, the, the notoriety and the scrutiny of, well, how's he doing? What's going on? All that kind of stuff. And just focus on, uh, getting better and, and trying to clear my head and, and, uh, and kind of get on with 2.0 and, and life after. And, uh, uh, you know, some people really struggle with it. And, and I think having the wherewithal and the ability to travel and kind of get off the grid and, and kind of clear your head and, and really uh, see, see parts of the world that uh, I didn't get an opportunity to when I was playing um, and training and preparing for the, for the seasons, um, that, that it was you know, great to see a different side of the world that you know, you're 
you know, it's, it's great. You're traveling as an athlete and traveling as a player, but you're going from the bus to the hotel, the hotel to the bus, to the arena, to the, you know, and then maybe you're going to dinner. If you, if you happen to be staying in a city the night before or the night after. Um, but it's, uh, you don't really get to see a lot of the world as much as people might think, right. uh, you know, it's pretty structured and, and you're, uh, uh, you don't get a lot of free time. So I, I see a map behind you. Where, where is the greatest place that you've ever traveled? Oh man. Uh, I've been to Japan. I've been to, uh, uh, Italy, France, England, uh, going to Greece this summer. Uh, there's a bunch of, uh, cool spots we're, we're looking into next year. Uh, we're going to go over the Maldives at some point. We're going to go down to the Great Barrier Reef in New Zealand, Australia, uh, Fiji, you know, Bora Bora. There's going to be some, uh, we, we got some good plans. <laughs> That's, that sounds incredible. Right I now, there's not enough the... time in the day to get there. Yeah. It's more about uh, making sure uh, you thoroughly plan and execute to uh, and map out your time when you're away. That's right. Things I do to hop on the Pronger family vacation trip right there. <laughs> that sounds incredible. Um, and so you mentioned that moment and that period when you, when you first retired from the NHL. And so that can be a really hard thing for a lot of pro athletes and, and not really knowing their next step. And actually, one of my first podcast episodes of Pass the Torch was with Lonnie Paxton, who you may or not be connected with, but yep. he's really great about after his football career and how he built his brand during his playing days to set himself up for life after sports. And so for you, I feel like you've done a lot of the same. You, you've taken advantage of social media, use it to your advantage to grow your company and build this brand, um, both well-inspired travels and your own personal brand. But for when you were tired, did you know exactly what you wanted to do right away or did you feel stuck? Uh, I didn't, you know, I, I was, I had a couple of great mentors in my life and they told me when I got hurt, they flew into Philly and, and sat down with me and were like, listen, you're going to, you're, you're done. You're going to get thrown a lot of different opportunities, whether it's, you know, charitable endeavors or, you know, business opportunities and things are like, you know, from our experience that first year, just say no to everything. Just, you got, you got to worry about your health. You got to worry about, you know, long-term uh, effects of, you know, the damage you put into your body. You, you need to get yourself healthy, get yourself right. And then all of that stuff will be there. And, and oh, by the way, it's going to sound great, but, you know, come three, four, five, six, seven, eight months down the line, who knows what you're going to be presented with. So, you know, take stock of what it is, you know, make notes, you know, tell them to get back to them, all that kind of stuff. And it was, it was great advice because it allowed me to, a, to get healthy. Uh, and it took a little bit more than a year. <laughs> it took a couple of years, but um, it also allowed me to really kind of refocus and energize you know i played 20 years in the league never really took much time off to you know think about my career think about what i've been able to accomplish think about you know everything that had transpired over that that time frame and uh you know really kind of took it easy and 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 really didn't do a whole lot um and and, and really focused in on on myself and my family and and from that you're you're going to be presented with opportunities and you know right out of the gate it was you know, do you want to, you know, work in player safety at the league? And, and it's, it sounded very interesting. A, a lot of other uh, players that I had played against and with the uh, Rob Blake and Shanahan uh, had, had been doing it and it seemed very interesting. So I did that for three years and I uh, signed as senior advisor with the Florida Panthers and Dale Talon to go work with him. Uh, and at that time I was kind of leaning to go down that track and, you know, you, you never know what you want to do until you kind of immerse yourself in it and and take stock of, of what's going on around you. And, and is it still of interest? And when I was growing up, I either wanted to be our GM president of a team, you know, after playing and then or I wanted to own my own and operate my own business. And uh, when you've gone down the one path and you're kind of it's a little murky, you know, there's the other side of it. And at the time, my wife had started the business and. I was helping her kind of get everything set up and I was very interested in how it was going to operate and run and how we we're going to manage everything. And, um, you know, it was, it was actually the perfect timing to, you know, what one, one door was quasi closing. And, you know, as I shut that door, this one was opening and it was a, 
a, a great opportunity to build something from the ground up and and really kind of you know do something together and and uh, and build a business out of it. Yeah, and I think that's great advice, right? To right after you retire, kind of just say no to everything and take some time for yourself and kind of reflect on your, on your own career. And so for a guy who had all the accolades you did, played 20 years, what what motivates you to be successful in business when you probably could just go hook up on some ranch and, and chill out? Uh, but what, <laughs> what what makes you want to be successful with Well-Inspired Travels in your business career? I, I think at the end of the day, you're hardwired a certain way. And, you know, that's the hard work that I put in, uh, you know, off the ice and, and on the ice is inherent in everything that I do with our company, Well-Inspired Travels, and how we manage and operate the business and how we work and, and how we work for our clients. It's, um, you know, that work ethic and that drive to, to a help people and B build out the business properly and, 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 uh, slowly, uh, you know, drives us every day. And, and, and so we have to look at all of those things each and every time we think about taking on new clients, you know, managing clients and, and where they're going, what they're doing, um, so it, it, it's a process and, and something that we're constantly looking at and, and, and trying to refine, uh, and then also, you know, enjoying life too, Yeah, <laughs> having right. a business and owning and operating a business. And then, oh, by the way, having a life and spending time with your kids and doing things outside of, uh, work life, so to speak, so that it doesn't consume you and, and eat you up is, is something that you got to have that balance. Right. And so I want to touch on one question about social media before diving into some rapid fire questions and we'll get you out of here. But so you seem to embrace the new age of social media really well. And I love Somewhat. it. I love, yeah, I know. I love following you across Twitter, Instagram. It's, it's great content. And so I guess, how has that helped you in your success? And um, do you encourage players to take advantage of it during their playing career to kind of build their own brands while they're playing, not put themselves out there too much, but kind of take advantage of their own brand to help set themselves up? Yeah, you know, I think you have an, uh, a pulpit, so to speak, and you have the ability to build out your brand and, and kind of start uh, the building blocks. It, 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 can be <laughs> it can be very touch and go at times. Right. Uh, especially Twitter, you know, at least Instagram, it's pictures, it's whatever, um, and, and you can do whatever. But Twitter, you, you got to, you know, there's obviously a lot of trolls. There's a lot of keyboard <laughs> tough guys. There's a lot of people sitting in their mom's basement uh, chiming in on this, that, and the other thing, like they're the authority on it. Uh, you know, it, it can be annoying at times where you're like, what is this guy? Or, what is this guy? What is this girl even saying? You handle the tough guys on the and ice. Then when you, yeah. Or just being stupid. Yeah. And then you, then you go click on their, their, their handle and you go, Oh, he's got four followers. <laughs> got it. Yeah. Enough said. Exactly. Where you think, oh, maybe I'm going to chime in. And then you're like, why am I wasting my time on somebody that has no clue? Right. And yeah. by the way, maybe they're not even real. <laughs> Who knows? Right. You probably handle the tough guys on the ice better than, than you can the social media trolls because you can just, it's quick. Yeah, I, you know what? It, it's, again, I learned early on in my career, you're not going to please everybody. Um, you know, you're going to piss some people off and you know what? So be it. Right. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not there to make them feel good. I'm there to provide you know, it's no different than talking about finances or talking about travel or talking about whatever. It is what it is. I'm not, I, if I post something, don't read it. If you don't right. like it, don't, don't follow me. Right. <laughs> you have a choice. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big part and it's a massive platform to help share your experiences, right? And I, I think yeah. that's important. And that's a big part of, yeah. of the business you're, business you're building. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, uh, it, it's been interesting. And uh you know, met a lot of great people, you know, there's obviously some tools, but <laughs> yeah. so be it. I mean, they're, they're every day out there too. They're, they're in real life as well. So it, uh, it's no big deal. And so I wanted to dive into some rapid fire here. You can do one, one word, one phrase, take as long as you want, um, but we'll get right into it. So who is your favorite athlete growing up as a kid? My favorite hockey player was uh, Mike Bossy when I was a youngster. Who is your favorite athlete to watch in current day sports? Oh, current day. Wow. I, I, to be honest with you, I don't watch one athlete. I don't watch, uh, you know, I guess, I, I guess I would say if, if I'm watching anybody when I'm watching, it'd be Connor McDavid just to see what he's going to do. Um, but I don't really 
pay attention to a, you know, a single player or, mm -hmm. you know, I'm more watching the teams, watching, you know, particular sports, you know, I like all, you know, tiger just to see how he's doing and things like that, but it's not, I'm immersed in it where, yeah. Oh my God, what's he doing? <laughs> and, and, you know, in that respect. So, but, but there's guys that you're watching, like you, you genuinely, you know, I wish him well, I wish him success. I hope you can see he's laboring out there and you can see his legs bothering him. It's, it's pretty impressive that he's been able to come back and play at all. Right. And sometimes that, oh my God, what is he doing? A reaction is when I watch Connor McDavid. That guy yeah. is a stud. Is a yeah. stud. It's uh yeah, it's it's must watch TV. Right. And so I'm gonna put you on the spot here, but who's gonna win the Stanley Cup this year? Ooh. Uh as of now, I have Tampa and Colorado in the final. Okay. No winner. Uh TBD. I want to okay. see. <laughs> I'll, I'll accept Follow that back up with me yeah i'll uh, accept that i'm not i'm not a hundred percent convinced in colorado's goaltending okay uh, because i don't know if they've been fully tested the way tampa might test them and and obviously tampa's goalies all world and is the sole reason why they're where they are right now mm -hmm. so until and let me put it this way i have tampa until you can knock off the champs they're the champs that's right. So let's let's go with that. I like it. And so we talked to this about this earlier and you're pointing across the map. But if you have to pick one place in the world that you've traveled, what, what is that one favorite place? One place in the world uh, would be Capri. In Italy, pretty, nice, uh, nice. pretty special spot. Now, what's on the bucket list? What's what's that one wish list place you want to go that you haven't been yet? Haven't been. We're uh, the Maldives is on the short list of the bucket list. Um, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, New Zealand. That trip would be uh, that's up there. Um, I got to make it to those South places. America. I haven't been to South America yet, so uh, I'd love to do a, a South America trip at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, mix in, you know, maybe the Galapagos or something but uh we'll see there's there's still a lot of time left <laughs> follow along on social media we'll, we'll see where you <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um and now what is your biggest fear spiders that's mine Snakes. that's my that's my answer every Snakes time spiders. yes those two exactly They're the not a big fan no 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 okay so last rapid fire here but what is one word that best describes you passion that's great and so, Chris, I appreciate the time today. Um, one final question to kind of wrap it all up. But if you had one biggest takeaway that you learned from your experience, both in sports and business and life, that you could pass along to the next generation to help them accomplish their goals, what would that be? Adversity. You're always gonna have. You're always gonna face adversity. You're always gonna be. Uh, you're all there's always gonna be a fork in the road, a left, a right. A, you know, there's always gonna be a decision. Uh, you know, what you do after the adversity, after you fail, after you choose poorly, uh, are you going to learn from it, pick yourself up, dust yourself off and go, uh, you know, get right back at it, or are you going to quit? And, you know, I think most people, unfortunately, in this world quit and don't realize how close they were to success. And it's a matter of just, if you fall down seven, get up eight, you know, it, it, there's all kinds of cliches that, uh, can follow adversity around, but you know, it's, it's pushing through hard moments, uh, pushing through difficult decisions and, and really just maximizing success by, by being present and, and being accountable. Yeah. Adversity is going to be a part of any journey you embark on, whether that's in sports, right. business, or life, and you got to embrace right. it and, uh, just keep moving. So thank you again. Uh, I really appreciate the time and, and hopefully chat soon. You bet. Sounds good.